Welcome everyone to our second webinar on motivational interviewing. I'm Livia Edegger and I'm the Deputy Director of ICEP, the International Society of Substance Use Professionals. For those of you who do not know us, we are an international organization. We have over 11,700 members in 167 countries. We at ICEP aim to bring together everyone working in the drug demand reduction field in prevention, treatment and recovery support. And we provide them with opportunities to access training and credentialing, to build networks, to share their knowledge and to learn from each other's work and experience. I would like to invite all of you who aren't already ICEP members to join us so that you can actually access all the wealth of information that we have on our website and that you can share your skills and also your knowledge with other members. You can apply for membership on our website at www.icep.net. Membership is for free and we have four different membership levels. We would also like to thank all of you for your patience last week. We are very sorry that some of you were not able to join us in the live session last week. We did uh, upload the recording, so it is available on our website. We will also upload the recording of this week's session. And we have upgraded our platform, so we can now allow for everyone to join. And we are very excited right now. I'm looking at the attendees numbers. Very, very excited to see that so many of you are joining us again. Um, thanks to all of you and especially to the ones that are joining us very, very late or very, very early into their day. We know that we have some people joining us actually at midnight. So thank you very much for your commitment. Uh, we will send a follow-up email in the coming days, including a certificate of attendance. We just want to clarify that these certificates that you receive um, are really just certificates of attendance and participation. So they're not a qualification. I would also uh, now take my time and introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Igor Kuchinok. Dr. Kuchinok is a professor of psychiatry at the University of California in San Diego. He's the director of the Center for Addiction Research, Training and Application. He is also the director um, of the SAMHSA PEPFAR, International Addiction Technology Transfer Center in the Ukraine, and a co-director of the SAMHSA PEPFAR Southeast Asia Addiction Technology Transfer Center. He's also the vice president of the International Consortium of Universities on Drug Demand Reduction, also known as ICUDDR. Thank you very much, Igor, and over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning for me. Uh, for some of you, it could be evening, could be uh, after, afternoon, whatever. Have a wonderful day or evening and let's spend some time together. We will continue our journey through the motivational interviewing. Uh, at the first session, uh, we talked about some fundamentals in the human behavior, particularly behaviors that are problematic and could be dysfunctional for people. And some of the fundamental concepts of motivational interviewing like ambivalence, resistance being ambivalence under pressure uh, and, and some other very very important fundamental things so today we will get closer to the motivational interviewing skills and we'll talk about it and we'll probably do some even practicing if possible considering the the online format we will see how it works first let's define what is motivational interviewing there are multiple definitions of motivational interviewing. Some of them are more research focused, others are more technical. Uh, there are some behavioral, so they, all of them are correct. Uh, th this is the definition that I would suggest uh, I, I'm offering you is something, a definition that I like probably the most. Uh, so motivational interviewing is a collaborative, person-centered and directive. Please pay attention. We will talk about the directiveness of a mind directive communication style to address the common problem of ambivalence and assist the uh, person to uh, strengthen internal motivation for change or at least some movements toward change. Uh, please folks pay attention to, to, to a couple of things. Uh, first, this is a communication style. Motivational interviewing is not a bunch of techniques. This is just a different way of being with another human being. This is a different style of having a conversation. Another important uh, word here in this definition is the word ambivalence, because if you remember the first at the first webinar, I tried to make it clear that the ambivalence is exactly the material that motivational interviewing works with. So this is the operational definition of motivational interviewing I would like you to 
uh, to, to pay attention to. Now, the motivational interviewing is not specific to substance use disorders. MI has been studied. There are more than 250 randomized clinical trials on the effectiveness of motivational interviewing across a variety of problem areas. Uh, the MI has been found uh, significantly more effective than traditional persuasion or traditional counseling approach in the uh, area of addiction medicine, gambling disorders, medication adherence in physical and behavioral medicine, diet, exercise, some of the mental health uh, disorders, eating disorders, criminal justice system. So the, uh, uh, motivational interviewing is not a specific approach, specific style only for people with substance use disorders. We are talking about substance use disorders simply because most of you work in the addiction medicine field. The, there are a couple of basic things. Let's go back to the basics a little bit. Uh, we call them the spirit of motivational interviewing. And I think it's quite important to talk about it before the, the skills. Whatever we do, using motivational interviewing with our clients it would be impossible to do it if we don't know if we did not had a conversation with the client what is the target behavior it has to be very specific in other words if the person tells you i want to become a better person it sounds very nice but it's not specific enough we don't know what is the definition of a better person the, the, so there is no target behavior here if the person tells you, I would like to exercise more or quit smoking or spend less time on the internet or stop drinking or lose weight, these are more specific things. So we first, we can do, we can utilize clinically motivational interviewing only if we, if we know clearly, we negotiated with the client, what is the target behavior? By the way, the target behavior most likely will change. The target behavior that the client will share with you at the beginning of your interaction and two weeks later could be two, two different things. Don't argue, accept it as it is. Another very important consideration in motivational interviewing and many other counseling strategies is the empathy. And I will tell you in five minutes something more about empathy. The One of the specific general principles of motivational interviewing is we are not telling the person what to do. We are trying to elicit from the person as much as possible the person's ideas, what the person thinks might be helpful, what are the previous experiences of success. So we are eliciting as much as possible instead of giving the solutions or offering suggesting the solutions. We emphasize the personal choice. Folks, people have the right and people are capable to make choices. Even in highly restrictive environments, in prisons, concentration camps, people are still making choices. And this is something that we absolutely must respect unconditionally, even if we disagree with the choice. And the, la the last principle is rolling with resistance instead of fighting resistance. Let's, and, and we will talk about it, and I will try to give you some examples. Now, a couple of words about empathy. There are so many different perceptions what empathy is, what it is not. If you ask 100 people randomly what is their definition of empathy, most likely you will get 100 different definitions. So let me try to define empathy for you. Empathy has nothing to do with agreeing or disagreeing with the client or having similar experiences or my transference uh, with the client's uh, problems or experiences, or sharing my personal experience with the client. These are things that have nothing to do with empathy. Empathy is the skill, and by the way, this is a trainable skill. You can train people. This is a skill of doing two, essentially two things. First, this is the skill of understanding the sources of the client's emotions, thoughts or actions so i understand where the client is coming from and the second skill is the ability to convey back your accurate understanding to the clients typically through reflections so first skill first part of the empathy i understand where you're coming from or i'm trying to understand where you're coming from 
And secondly, I will show you that I do understand through reflections. As you can see, empathy has nothing to do with agreeing or disagreeing with the client or making the client to agree with you. You can interview a serial killer, something that clearly the actions, something you definitely disagree with and still be empathetic. This is quite important, folks. And again, empathy is not a specific fundamental principle to motivational interviewing. This is in fact a, part, a big part of any kind of counseling. Uh, empathy is like, I, I like this, this comparison. Empathy is like fuel in your car. The gas, the fuel in your car does not define where are you going, whom are you going with, when are you gonna stop for a cup of coffee? It doesn't define any of these things, but you are not going anywhere without it anyway. So this is what empathy is in behavioral science in generally and particularly important in, in motivational interviewing. One of the things relevant to empathy and relevant to specific issues in, in MI, one of the typical traps that we set up ourselves in is the expert trap. This is one of many, but this is something for all of us to, 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 to consider. And I will tell you more, more of the uh, roadblocks to good interactions. The expert trap is, uh, you know, traditionally we are trained in most cases in most countries in the world. We are trained to uh, assume the expert role because people come to us for advice, for help. So we are helping professionals. And a big part of our training is to accept the idea that I am the expert in the patient's problem in the patient's life. You see, I have a bunch of certificates behind me and I work hard to, to get them. W what do they actually say? Well, as a physician, as a psychiatrist, my certificates say, well, I'm, I've been trained to recognize symptoms, put them into a syndrome, then to do a differential diagnosis, then some treatment plan, then provide some treatment, do some tests and all of these things. So I, I've been trained and I have some expertise in doing this particular type of work. Now, the question is, do these certificates make me an expert in your life? Not at all. Not at all. Who is the expert in your life? You. You're with yourself all the time. You're with your internal dialogue all the time. It sounds like a, this is a bad news since I don't have any expertise in my clients, my patients' lives, so what am I doing? But in fact, this is actually a very good news because the client came to you and by just by the virtue of coming to you for whatever reason, the client made this huge amount of expertise available to you. It would be, forgive me, stupid not to use it. So the expert trap, when I start pretending that I know better what is, what, what is needed for the client, just because I've been trained to do so, usually I will hit a roadblock and the client will become very defensive. Let me try to show you something. I want you to pay attention to a, to a video. Okay, so we've, we've talked about your labs and you seem to have a good grasp of that and uh, we've talked about the different options for medicines and uh, I, think, I think you'll agree that, that, uh, that the last option we talked about it is the best way to go in terms of the, the financial cost of it and the side effect profile and so I'd like to just go ahead and write you the prescription. I'm not r quite ready for that if it's okay. I, I, I'm just not comfortable yet. I'm still not convinced. I'm not sure I want to do this. I mean, this is like a big step for me. And uh, I want to know, are there alternatives, for example? George, we, we've been through this. Uh, we've, we've talked about the alternatives and, and unfortunately... Yeah, but the alternatives were all sort of like Western medicine. I mean, is there like Eastern medicine I could use? You've been on the internet again, haven't you? Yeah, I have. And it's a, it's a world out there. Yeah. Well, it's it's a it's a big, confusing world, and I'm I'm glad you, you know you, you came here because really you could spend a lot of money and a lot of time out there and not get what you need. 
we've talked we've talked about your lab values and we've talked about the benefits of taking this medicine and as we weighed out the cost versus the benefits it seems really clear to me ok let me just ask without being too sensitive here should I ask for a second opinion will that make a difference you can ask for a second third and fourth opinion they're all going to tell you the same thing it's it's not subtle I mean at this point the numbers are high and the reasons to take medicine are clear I guess maybe the thing that I'm not making clear is for myself is just the whole idea of spending the rest of my life stuck on a medicine I mean, I watched my parents go down that road and it just was one medicine after another and there they sat and next thing I knew it was just constantly running to and from the pharmacy and I'm really not too excited about that for myself well I don't blame you for not being excited about that picture but the alternative picture I think is a lot less exciting and if and if it takes a pill to keep you alive and and relatively healthy as long as your parents have been I think that pill is probably the option for you well let me let me try something else is there something I'm not making clear about is there something I should be thinking about before I take this step thinking isn't going to lower your cholesterol uh, unfortunately so I'm stuck well you, you're not stuck because we, we've got this medicine and the medicine well the medicine, I'm stuck <laughs> yeah I mean that's the way it comes down is like it's a blind alley no choice you got this to do and it doesn't make me feel comfortable to be perfectly honest, if, if I have a choice between you being comfortable and you having a healthy cholesterol, I'm going to take the second choice. Will and, that make me comfortable? Well, you'll ha you, at that point, we'll, we'll have a chance to talk about it. I'm worried that if you don't take this medicine, we won't have a chance to talk about it because your numbers are high. They really are. Yeah, I guess. I'll go ahead and write out that script. So sort of like getting a speeding ticket, isn't it? Well, hopefully a little less painful, a little more helpful. Yeah, all right. Okay. Okay, folks. Let's think about it. What is happening between these two people? What is happening seems, feels like a wrestling match. The, uh, the target behavior is the medication for high cholesterol. Clearly, the patient is very ambivalent, rightfully so. Anybody would be. What the doctor is doing, in fact, everything that the doctor said from the fact perspective is accurate. The doctor did not say anything that is not true. But the style, the way he is doing that, is practically blocking every type, every, every chance for an effective communication between these two people. The doctor has his own agenda. The doctor is trying to push the client to accept the doctor's agenda. The client is pushing back. The doctor doesn't really get any clue, any, any, any listening of the client's speech. So in this case, if I ask you, what are the chances that this client will actually start taking medication? My mind, in my mind, the chances are minimum to zero, exactly because of the communication style between these two people. Now, and the doctor, what the doctor is lacking, not the content. The doctor is totally lacking empathy, any empathy to the client situation. Now, let's watch these two people discussing exactly the same issue, but this time the doctor's style is different. Now the doctor is using some of the motivational interviewing skills, and we will talk about the skills after the video. And, and you're, believe it or not, you're not the first guy that's told me his wife made him come in to talk about this stuff. I don't understand. Why are they so into this medicine stuff? I don't know. They, I, I wonder if they're worried about you. Hmm. That, when I stop to think about it, I suppose, there's nobody else that can change the lights on the ceiling. Yeah. Well, here I am. What do I have to do? Well... I'm hoping that we, that we don't need to talk about it in terms of what you have to do. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, from our discussion before about your cholesterol and, and the role that medicine might play in lowering your cholesterol, that uh, you can make an informed decision about, about your treatment options and, and we can go from there. But I've got to tell you, my head swims when I think of all the options. Yeah. I mean, an informed decision is one thing. You get this much information. 
you probably already know, I checked out the internet, yeah. and it's just like, whoa. I could lay out in a cornfield with a cone hat on, and it would maybe lower my cholesterol, they right. say. There's a million options out there. Well, I, so where do I go? Should I, should I seek a second opinion? Yeah. Well, let's see what we can do in here today, and then you'll know that at any point in time you can seek, seek further opinions and consultation if you well, think well, that'll make it get, easier. I don't want to make it sound like I don't trust you. Okay. And I do. You've been good so far. But this is a big decision on my part. And I, it is. And it's sort of terrifying. It's sort of like I'm becoming mortal. Yeah. I don't like that. No. No, I hear you. It's, it's scary to think about things that might shorten your life and that's really what we're talking about here and the, the high cholesterol is as we've said is a, is a pretty important risk factor for pretty serious pretty serious disease and that's why we're talking about serious treatment options um, like you said the medicine's not fun it's not fun to think about having to take a medicine for a long time or even maybe for the rest of your life and uh, I wouldn't want to suggest that as a treatment option if I didn't think it might be helpful for you but like you said there are lots of other options um, Let's, let's pick an arbitrary number. Let's, let, let me have you t tell me just briefly about the three options that you're thinking about right now. The cornfield with the aluminum cone cap. Yeah. Yeah. Let's <laughs> no. keep that on the list. Exercise. Okay. Diet. Uh -huh. And uh, more exercise. Okay. So exercise seems like a really good option for you. Yeah, I need it. I could use it. It would be good. Yeah. If I worked out twice as much, would it help? I think it certainly would help. And uh, I don't think you'd find a doctor in this office, and you certainly didn't find one here today, that's going to discourage you from doing exercise. Um, I'd love to talk to you more, and I've got some information that might be helpful for you about the types of exercise that you could do that would be most helpful. And even if you end up taking the medicine, I think you should, you should seriously consider doing that exercise as part of your treatment plan. But you still think the medicine should go along with it? From what we've seen thus far, the medicine seems like an important part of the treatment plan. I'm not going to be taking the medicine. You would be taking the medicine. And uh. so my job today is to make sure that I've answered all the questions that you have so that if, in fact, I do write this prescription, we have a good sense that you'll give it a try, take the medicine, and see if it helps. If I consent to you writing the prescription, will you tell my wife that I was a good patient? <laughs> I think I'd probably go ahead and tell her that you were one of the better patients. <laughs>
there is a strategy that might help you if you need to share information with a client or you need to give advice remember first that unsolicited advice will always result in defensiveness if you think about your friend close friend who is madly in love and you see that the, the qualities that your friend sees in this another person they just don't exist which is not uncommon if you try to convince your friend that being madly in love is fine but he or she is making a big mistake typical result the typical result you will lose a friend people will still do whatever they decide to do but you will lose a friend because this is an unsolicited advice people become typically very defensive if you need to give advice there is a strategy that you may consider this is one of the skill motivational interviewing before sharing any information or giving any advice ask the client what is your understanding of x what is your understanding of alcohol dependence or what is your understanding of diabetes what is your understanding of exercise or fitness and then listen very carefully no matter what the client says even if it sounds totally bizarre doesn't matter listen for a couple of seconds a couple of minutes you ask the client's understanding now you listen then the next step is ask permission you ask the client do you mind if i share with you a couple of ideas or a couple of thoughts that might be helpful if the answer is a no which is very unlikely so don't do it move on typically the answer is yes now you got the permission to share from this point further you can share any information you can give any advice you want and then at the end of this conversation you ask the client again after we had this exchange what is your understanding of x now if we do it this way you will be able to provide the client with information provide the client give the client an advice without making the client defensive so what is your understanding of x do i have your permission to share with you some information then share the information whatever you want to share and then ask for understanding again this is sometimes we call it the motivational interviewing sandwich this is the strategy that might be helpful in motivational interviewing there are four fundamental processes and the fundamental processes i'm talking about are there are four three of them are circular only one is linear, and I will help you understand it right now. You cannot do anything with anyone without engagement. If the client is not sufficiently engaged, engaged with you, if the client is not interested in talking to you, it doesn't make any sense to continue because you're wasting time. When you've got some engagement from the client, then you can move to the focusing and the focusing in fact it is a conversation about what is the target behavior today you remember you can't do anything unless you are clear with the client what is the target for today very likely this will change the if the client is engaged by the way speaking about engagement every time you see the client you will have to re-engage the client it may take a couple of seconds but you do have to re-engage the client engagement is like a shower you do it every day every meeting with the client will start with new re-engagement focusing what the target of your conversation will be today will change uh, almost for sure it will change do not insist that the focus that the client is seeing now the target behavior that is the most problematic is actually the wrong idea because you have a better idea if the client tells you i want to get my phd in neuroscience and the client is actively using amphetamines that doesn't seem like a very realistic idea and the internal impulse in you and in me would be well how 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 come you want to get your phd since you're using amphetamines that would be your target suppress this impulse you will be able to get back to amphetamine use suppress the impulse to argue if the client says that the uh, phd is the most important thing today 
let's talk about it. We will get to the point of conversation about drug use. And then the third process is eliciting the client's ideas about, about what might help or what the client thinks needs to occur. And then the last one, the last process, the fourth process, which is the only one that is linear, is planning. You cannot do any planning without sufficient engagement, without clear target, although this will change, without eliciting from the person what exactly the person's thoughts are. And after these three things are taken care of, then you can do some planning. In other words, if this is your first meeting with a client, asking the client, what is your drug of choice or what are your plans for the future doesn't make any sense. You will make the client very defensive. It's too early for this type of conversation. This is one of the typical, the typical things that unfortunately I've seen a lot of times in addiction treatment. Uh, we, we need to learn how to suppress the desire to talk about something that we, we believe is the focus and continue listening. These four processes, uh, and the analogy for the four processes, engagement means asking a question, how shall we travel together? The focusing means we are discussing where we're going. Evoking or eliciting will discuss why do we do that? And the planning is similar to a discussion, how and when are we going to do that? This is one of the typical challenges in particularly in addiction medicine, but in general, uh, in the physical medicine, in general medicine as well, but particularly in addiction uh, and addiction psychiatry and addiction medicine is something that we have developed over time, typically through our training, is writing reflex. Believing that we know what is best for the client simply because we have been trained uh, actually will result in significant defensiveness and resistance. Uh, if, if I start persuading the client, here's what you got to do if you want to accomplish that. If I start doing that, folks, believe me, I'm not telling anything that the client doesn't know or hadn't considered before or maybe even had tried and failed. So if I start telling the person, here is what we need to do to fix the situation, most likely I'm telling something that this person had already considered or maybe had already tried. So the real message I'm sending to the client, you are incompetent. Everyone will become very defensive, which will result in a power struggle. You remember the first interaction between the client, the patient and the doctor. That's exactly the wrestling match. That's exactly the boxing competition. This has nothing to do with treatment. The treatment stops at this point. There is nothing therapeutic going on. This is a client who will become, if the client decides, okay, I'm not arguing with you because it doesn't make sense, the client will become very passive recipient of your expertise and most likely will never show up again in your office. And unfortunately, this way, we are losing a lot of people in our treatment attempts. In terms of the fundamental motivational interviewing skills, therefore, and the acronym is ORS, and these four skills on the list, this is not a sequence of importance. This is not a sequence of anything. We call them, we, we, we put them in this sequence simply because of the acronym ORS. ORS stands for open ended questions, affirmations reflections and summaries and i will walk you through all of these four skills today and the next our, at our next seminar webinar in order to master motivational interviewing you need to master all four of these skills it's unfortunate i've seen um, in many countries in the world and in the us I've seen people telling me, yes, we are using motivational interviewing because we ask open-ended questions. Wonderful. What about the rest of the skills? Folks, if you, if you don't master all four of them with proper timing, with proper listening, it will be like rowing with one oar. You will go in circles. 
and this interaction is actually is not going to be very effective, not neither terribly therapeutic. This is why it's important to master all of these four fundamental skills and motivational interviewing. Let's start with the first one. I've heard it many times that open-ended questions are good, closed-ended questions are bad. Probably some of you have heard it as well. But this is, folks, this is not exactly true. Actually, it's not true at all. These are two different types of questioning, and they serve different purposes. We need both. Closed-ended questions are the questions that can be answered yes or no, or we limit the, the, the options for answering. When, when a physician asks you on a scale 0 to 10, how bad is your headache? This is a very important question. But this is a closed-ended question because your options in answering are very limited. Closed-ended questions are fact-finding questions. They have nothing to do with motivation. But yet they're important. We need to find some facts. How many times have you used marijuana in the last week? Or how many drinks did you have last night? Uh, you're asking specific information. You're getting specific answers. Definitely, it would be nice to try to limit the amount of closed-ended questions or, if possible, to convert them, convert them into open-ended questions. But the important thing for me here to, to, to let you know is that we need both types of questions simply because they serve different purposes. They are neither good nor bad. Open-ended questions typically start with what, how, tell me more, please describe, help me understand, what do you think will be some of the benefits of doing this, how do you think you, may, you could manage your craving, or tell me more about your experience at home. These are open-ended questions. Questioning in general is not a part of good listening, but at least when we ask open-ended questions, the client will come up with a narrative. You will, you will give the client the opportunity to, to share more and to tell the story. Closed-ended questions, they typically start with do you, did you, can you, have you, uh, how many times? Uh, again, these are important questions. I would suggest you every, every time you feel like asking a closed-ended question, take a deep breath and think in your mind, can I convert it into an open-ended question? Because that might be a better idea in this case to ask. The bottom line is neither question Neither type of questioning is good or bad. They just serve different purposes. In our life and in our profession, we often ask questions that I call them the dead questions. I mean, the questions that, that are capable to ruin any kind of relationship. Why don't you? Why can't you? Why haven't you? What keeps you? Uh, why do you have to smoke? Folks, this type of questioning, as common as it is in our life and in our profession, almost for sure will result in high defensiveness and resistance and the there will be a significant breakdown in your relationship with the client so i would suggest you to be mindful uh when you feel like i mean we are all humans we are not computers sometimes we have impulses to ask questions or to say certain things well this is the difference between a professional and non-professional Non-professionals, people, random people on the streets, they can operate out of their impulses. You, as professionals, you don't have the luxury of operate out of your impulses. We need to operate our, for our, out of our professional skills. So I would suggest you to be mindful and try to avoid as much as possible this type of question. I will give, since you have my slides, uh, this will be your homework assignment for yourself. Uh, converting open-ended questions, uh, closed-ended questions into open-ended questions. As simple as it sounds, as soon as you will start doing it at home, should you decide to do it, and I would suggest you to try, you will see that actually it's not that easy. It, it is easy to talk about it, but when we, when we actually have to do it, uh, that typically is a little bit more difficult than people think. Now, the next skill 
is affirmations. It's ors or open-ended questions. A, affirmations. Affirmations means we acknowledge struggles, we acknowledge successes, we acknowledge skills, uh, we don't necessarily have to acknowledge the, the concrete action. Uh, we, we, we may support the way the person thinks, or we can acknowledge, affirm the feelings. Here is the important thing, folks. We know it for hundreds of years that any behavior that gets positive reinforcement from the environment, gets rewards and positive feedback, is likely to become repetitive. And we also know that any behavior that gets negative feedback from the environment is likely to extinguish. We know that. So if you see the client is doing something that is going toward the positive behavioral change, even if this is not a complete action, even this is something that the client said that is interesting, that is positive, that is smart, it's worth affirming. You know, I like the way you said that. Or I definitely understand, I, I definitely understand the way you probably feel right now. It must be quite difficult for you to, to go through all of these things. I'm really glad you managed to stay away from alcohol for a whole week. Uh, you, you, you succeeded five years ago and you were sober for three weeks. That's, that's an interesting. So apparently you were capable of doing that. Folks, the, one of the important things here is, there are a couple. First, the affirmations must be very specific. So by saying, oh, you are a good guy, it sounds nice, but it, it, it goes above the head completely. You're not affirming anything because it's not specific. So you're affirming a specific thought or a specific action or a specific feeling. And the second important thing in, uh, for affirmation to make it powerful, it must be as close to actual behavior or actual thinking as possible. If you see a behavior and you decided to affirm it three days later, the data shows actually it's been studied quite carefully. There is an exponential decrease in the effectiveness of your affirmation fivefold, five times. So if you decide to postpone your affirmation with three days, so the effect, the effect of your affirmation will be 15 times less compared to your affirming the behavior exactly at the moment when, you, when it happened. So with affirmations, it, it is really important to be very specific and to be quick, to do it really exactly when, when there is something affirmable. Affirmation can include comments you, it seems like you're a real survivor. You're a strong person. Uh, appreciate, I appreciate that you, you talk to me openly and honestly. This, this is probably not easy for you, particularly when you talk uh, with clients under criminal justice supervision. Uh, you can affirm thoughts, actions, the way the person said something. The, these, the affirmative statements are very likely will result into more of the desirable behaviors because you're reinforcing something that you're looking forward and you really would like to see repeating. Again, this will be your homework assignment. <clears throat> this is a set of statements from a real client, a real patient of mine. Here is what he said. I'm not doing it now. You will read it at home if you want to do your homework. Read it and try to come up with at least four affirmative statements that are specific enough to affirm something that is affirmable in the client's statements. Now, let's start reflections. Let's start it today and we will continue reflections uh, at the next webinar. Reflections is the most effective and the most difficult to skill in motivational interviewing to master. Why do we talk about reflections? Well, first, Listening is fundamental to motivational interviewing, and actually it's fundamental to any kind of counseling. Folks, let me tell you something. We are very good in talking. We are not typically that good in listening. It takes for human beings to 
two years to start talking and then the rest of the life to stop. We really need to learn how to listen. Listen with the, with the intent to understand. Unfortunately, in most cases, we listen with the intent to respond. We need to start trying to teach ourselves, to train ourselves how to listen with the intent to understand. Reflective listening is the fundamental skill in motivational interviewing. This is a difficult skill to master. It may happen with practice. It will happen with practice should you decide to, to practice. There are several functions of reflections. The, the simplest, the easiest function of reflections is the accuracy. You know, when, when two people are talking with no time constraints, with no stress whatsoever, uh, just under normal, best possible cir circumstances, two people are having a conversation. There are already four places to make a mistake. If I'm a speaker and you're the listener, what I said may not necessarily be what I wanted to say. What did you hear? may not necessarily be what I did actually say. What you think I meant by saying that may have nothing to do with what I actually meant. You see, uh, even under the best circumstances, we already have many places to make a mistake, to make an error. The amount of errors goes up exponentially when we are under stress or time constraints or any kind of pressure from, from the environment then we are really likely to make a mistake. When we reflect back, reflection is exactly what it says. I'm putting a mirror in front of you. Here is what you just said. By doing that, I'm sending a couple of very important messages. First, I'm trying to understand. So I'm here, I'm present. You are important. Otherwise, if you're not important, why would I try? And I'm curious. I really want to find out what is the rationale for you to say that, that or to think that way. So one of the one of the major functions of any kind of reflection, because there are many different reflections, is the accuracy function. I'm trying to make sure I understood you accurately. Why do we emphasize reflection so much? Well, because if you look at the data. And there are a huge number of studies. All the data, all of the studies actually show pretty much the same thing. People tend to talk more in, respond, in response to reflections rather than questions. When we question people, typically they don't feel like we are listening. They feel like we are satisfying our agenda, even with the best intentions. And when we are asking questions, our agenda is in the middle of the conversation. When we reflect, actually the client's agenda becomes a center, a focus of the conversation. We also know that when we reflect more than ask, people tend to be more truthful. This is something quite important for, for me to, uh, to emphasize, and then we will stop for questions particularly those of you who work in addiction medicine, and many of you do, uh, this is not a big secret that in many instances, at least initially, at the beginning of our interaction with the clients, they many of them tend to be, let's say, less than truthful. They don't necessarily give us the right information. The easiest way to explain it would be just to say, well, they're liars which could be the case in some cases, I think that would be too simplistic. Uh, think about yourself, and I'm not asking you to answer, and you, you cannot answer in this webinar format. Just think about it. Has it ever happened to you to lie your dentist about flossing? Or has it ever happened to you to lie a police officer when you were pulled over for speeding? This is a normal human experience. We are trying to protect ourselves from being lectured, from being told what to do because we don't like being told what to do. Nobody does. So when it happens and our clients 
expect from us lectures or prescriptions or advices, people automatically try to protect themselves. This is a very complex behavior. And they give us information that is not necessarily accurate. The studies show, many studies show, that people are much more truthful responding to your reflections rather than your questions. Reflections and questions are very different. And this will be the last slide for today. They are very different even the way they sound. Reflections are always statements, never a question. What makes your sentence sound like a statement rather than a question? In most languages in the world, your sentence will sound like a question if the tone of your voice goes up at the end of the sentence. And your sentence will sound more like a statement if the tone of your voice goes down. Even if you use exactly the same words, the reading and the message you are sending, just by changing the tone of your voice, will be very different. Imagine you have a client in front of you who tells you, I want a divorce. Quite important fact. Here is the reaction number one. You want a divorce? Here is the reaction number two. So you want a divorce. Do you understand the difference? Do you see the difference? Exactly the same words, exactly the same sequence of words. Typically, the message will be very different. A client says, I feel uncomfortable. You feel uncomfortable? This is a question. So you feel uncomfortable. It's a statement. It's a reflection. Even by changing the tone of your voice, you will get two completely different messages. And at this point, with this slide, I think we will finish the webinar today. And the next webinar, we will continue with reflections and we'll do some exercises. And we will continue and we will finish the fundamental skills in motivational interviewing. And I want to thank you for working with me today. I hope what we said makes sense. And I hope this will help you in continuing your journey through learning motivational interviewing. And I will be happy to assist you as much as I can with that. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. That was uh, fantastic again. And we have had um, excellent response from our participants. So thank you, everybody, for sending your questions in. Um, most of the questions, Igor, came in under two topics. And sort of given the time, I'm going to tell you about both, and then you might be addressing one in next week's session. Um, a lot of questions around how to work with clients that are not fully engaged. Maybe they're not communicative, they are um, maybe they're there because they don't necessarily want to be. Um, maybe they are want to change something, but they want the practitioner to do the work for them rather than the sort of self work they need to do on themselves. And the second subject is very much about evaluation of this as a technique uh, for the practitioner and for the process, you know, what some tips on how to evaluate how effective our listeners are when they start to put this into, pra into practice. Let's start with the first question because it's a brilliant question. And in fact, yeah. the question is, since we said that motivational interviewing, the material that motivational interviewing works with is the ambivalence, this hesitation. And this is a very common question. Okay, then what to do with clients who are not ambivalent or they don't appear to be ambivalent? Is there anything we can do using motivational interviewing? And the, the truth is actually yes. If the client is not ambivalent, the only thing you can do, make the client ambivalent create the ambivalence and here is the way you can do it you can do it by asking just one question i mean there are many things many ways you can do it this is the way i do it you don't necessarily have to use my way should you decide to quit drinking one day what do you think your life will look like just pay attention let me repeat it should you decide to quit drinking or to start exercising or stop using heroin or whatever it doesn't matter should you decide to, to change it? 
what do you think your life will look like? You see what I'm saying here? First, should you decide? I'm not on the driver's seat, you are. Should you decide to do it one day? I'm not asking you to do anything now. This is a hypothetical. Should you decide to, to quit drinking one day? What do you think your life will look like or what do you think will happen in your life? I'm making it hypothetical. I'm not putting any pressure. I'm not telling what you what to do. The only thing I'm asking is, let's use our fantasy if you wish. Mm -hmm. Folks, by doing just that, I automatically will make this client ambivalent. And now I have some material to work with. That's exactly what motivational interviewing can do. Remember, folks, there is one thing that is quite important. There, there, you all know about the concept of denial, something that we have been using for decades, particularly in addiction medicine. The client is in denial, so there is nothing we can do, and the patient in denial does not, doesn't know he's in denial because he's in denial. Well, if you look at the literature, if you look at the psychology, clinical psychology literature, hundreds of studies, they show pretty much the same thing. The concept of denial actually doesn't exist. The psychological construct of denial, that there is no evidence it does exist. What does exist is very high level of ambivalence. That sounds like a total pre-contemplation, what Prochaska and Di Clemente used to call it, pre-contemplation, meaning lack of any awareness. There is no such a thing like a lack of any, any awareness. What there is, a very high level of ambivalence. So if this is something that you are facing and the client doesn't seem like very motivated and the client is totally saying, well, I don't have any problem. This is all BS. I mean, they're, they're just after me for whatever reason. Accept it. You know, I don't know your story yet. You might be right. I have no reasons not to believe you. This is interesting and it must be really difficult for you to live like that. A client who comes to you and says, I have absolutely no problem with drugs and alcohol. This judge, this <laughs> judge is is nasty human being. He is after me. That's why I'm here. He said, I must be in probation. The last thing you want to do is to get into an argument, even though you have all the facts in front of you. I mean, what I would do, I'd say, you know what? It's really difficult not having control over your life. You must be really upset. I'm just emphasizing the reality by doing that i'm making the person more ambivalent right there i hope i did answer the question yeah no that was very uh, comprehensive thank you and just to um add to that because i don't think we've got time to tackle the other one about evaluation but just to add to that um i had a few sort of discussions actually on, on, online about can you give some more examples of the types of behavior that can be amended because some people were asking about different things like about anxiety and where that crosses into the actual behavior that can be addressed with this technique so maybe some examples would help our listeners you know the motivational interviewing as you remember i said this is not just a set of techniques this is a different way of being with a human being this could be a standalone intervention for some people who are clearly ambivalent about certain things motivational interviewing the relational skills could be an adjunct to other things because MI is very compatible with cognitive behavioral therapy, with pharmacotherapy. So if you need to, if you treat somebody with anxiety, I don't think motivational interviewing alone will help. But if you do cognitive behavior or hypnosis or use medications, motivational interviewing can help you with treatment adherence. This is something that will actually increase your effectiveness significantly and drastically. So let's use common sense. MI is not a solution for every problem. For some patients, some clients who are very ambivalent, MI is by far more effective than traditional approach of persuading or being an expert telling people what to do. Or you can use MI in conjunction with other treatment strategies that you use because MI is not the only thing that we do. Excellent. Thank you, Igor. Another fascinating um, hour. Thank you to the ISAP staff that are there behind the scenes um, setting all of this up and working uh, online to support all of our participants. And thank you very much to all of you that are listening for this hour. We um, will have the slides, a video of this uh, webinar, 
and um, any additional resources. Um, so as uh, Igor referred to something, a task that you can all do. So that will all be on the ISEP website. So um, please check to find those resources there. And we thank you all for joining us and we look very much forward to seeing you all in a week. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.